Hello, I'm Rob Rue with Littleton and Rue Funeral Home. On behalf of the family, I want to thank you for showing your support online today. We understand that these are very difficult times, and we want family and friends to witness this celebration of life within their individual comfort zones. This live stream will remain available on our Facebook page and can be freely shared with anyone. Thank you for showing support and feel free to make comments below to the family. You may also visit littletonandrue.com to leave expressions of sympathy and view the memorial video. Remember, your presence is important, whether it's here at the service or online. Thank you for showing compassion to the family today. Would you sing with us, please? saying that. <laughs> the prophet Isaiah was a figure of authority and influence in ancient Jerusalem with unencumbered access to King Hezekiah of Judah, often being summoned for advice and wisdom and counsel about the word of the Lord. And in the midst of the prophecies, his prophecies about the coming Messiah, he offers us these words of hope in our day of trouble today. Comfort, comfort my people. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Do you not know, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and increase, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, ah, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Today we remember a man whose hope, whose great hope was and is in the Lord. Your dear loved one, Terry Whetstone. 74 good years of life, leaving a legacy of faithfulness and honor to his family, to his country, and to his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the family would love to express to you their gratitude and their thanks for all your all of you coming today for your encouragement, your handshakes, your hugs, your smiles, your laughter, your tears, everything that you've given to them in love. Each of you honors Terry and this family by your presence here. And this is a time that memories will come flooding back, and there will be smiles and there will be tears, and all of that will be okay. The Bible tells us there is a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. In fact, the shortest verse in the Bible tells us 
Jesus wept. He wept. He grieved. He had sorrow over the death of his dear friend Lazarus. And in that moment of his sorrow, he turned to his heavenly father. And that would be a good thing for us to do right now. Would you pray with me? Father, you are our creator. The author of life, which is such a precious gift to us all. And we come today to commemorate, to honor, and to celebrate Terry Whetstone. A life well lived. A man, a, a husband, a brother, a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, an uncle, a colleague, a friend, a proud patriot who is so precious to us. And we mourn because he's no longer with us. We feel a void that has been created in our heart, an emptiness in our spirit that, that Terry's life spilled into us. And so we lift up our sadness and grief to you. And Father, we ask that you would comfort us in our sorrow and bring us an abundance of your gentle healing mercies. And may the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and minds. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing this hymn, one of Terry's favorites.
Terry Whetstone quietly went to be with the Lord yeah. on Saturday, June 19th, 2021 at Hearth and Home here in Springfield, Ohio. And he'll be missed by so many. He'll be missed by his loving wife of 55 years, Jan. Jan, Terry knew you loved him. You loved him faithfully and fully and fiercely. And for 55 years, you have been blessed to be adored by him. He'll be missed by his siblings, his brother Jerry, his sister Deb. He'll be missed by his children, Lisa Beeler and uh, Steve Whetstone. His grandchildren, Jessica, Drew, Kat, Tyler, Elena, and Adam. His great-grandchildren, Reed, Stella, and Lyra. Nieces and nephews, colleagues, so many colleagues, sons of the American Revolution, particularly those of the George Rogers Clark chapter. Terry held various offices um, with that organization and served as the Ohio State President in 2003. He will be missed by his first Christian church family, where he was a member for 39 years and served as a deacon for 25 years. And he'll be missed by so many uh, dear, dear, dear friends. Just now, um, some family want to share some words of memory and tribute. First of all, his daughter, Lisa Bielert, and following her, his brother, Jerry Whetstone. Terry Allen Whetstone. T is her teacher. Daddy taught Steve and I about life. He instilled in us a hunger for knowledge. He would often read four and five books at one time. <laughs> he taught me how to be a better writer. That's one of the reasons I honor him today with adjectives. He was also known for being a substitute teacher. So often he would be out with mom or us somewhere and a young person might yell from even almost across the store and say, Hi, Mr. Whetstone, you are my sub at such and such store, uh, school. E is for elaborate. Daddy was very thorough and detailed. <laughs> he could definitely, ela definitely elaborate on any subject. His job of finding enemy jets, fuel tanks, and anti-aircraft guns was imperative to our Air Force and Navy pilots during the Vietnam War. And later on, he could look at pictures taken by ultrasonic speed airplanes to pick out movement of the Soviet or the North Korean missiles. R is for real and respect. Daddy was a real person. He was honest. He didn't pretend about things. He was always, always respectful, and he expected us to respect him, our country, our mom, and each other. If I was misbehaving, Daddy would snap his fingers, and I would come to attention, not like a soldier necessarily, but I would sit up and look at him because I knew that I was doing something that he didn't approve of. One day, I remember, I had sassed mom, and he reached over and just whacked me on the bottom. And I knew I had really disappointed him, because he rarely did that. So I, of course, wailed. <laughs> but I saw that disappointment in his eyes of not honoring mom. That became a huge motivator to me to be good. I never wanted to see that look of disappointment on either of their faces. So I strive to be perfect. Then we met Jesus here at First Christian, and I learned about grace, and that perfection was not anything I could be, or even what I needed to be. Ours for resolve. Daddy was never a give up type of guy. He taught me the importance of perseverance. I have this ring that I wear, and it says never give up, and it reminds me of him. See things through. Complete the task and don't give up. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, he wrote, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest 
if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Why is for young at heart. <laughs> Dad could act crazy and be animated retelling stories, either from our family or even about jets. Top Gun was one of his favorite shows, even though it was about the Navy. <laughs> but any footage of where the jets were flying, Daddy could reenact, like this one up right ways and this one upside down, or whatever. <laughs> uh, his middle name, Alan. A is for American, and that's all I have to say about that one. L, love. He loved Mom. We always knew that he loved Mom. He kissed her every day when he got home from work. And if Steve and I were in the room, he would say, do you know how much I love your mom? <sighs> he loved us. Of course, I don't remember when I was born, but I do know the story from the next day. He was so excited to be a dad, and he was in the ROTC program while he was at college at High University. Each year, they had to take a physical fitness test. Well, the day after I was born, apparently that was the day they had to do that. Daddy beat everyone in the running part of the test, except for the guy that was a marathon runner. <laughs> and when Steve was born, I was five. I don't remember a whole lot of that, but I knew he was so proud to have a son to carry on the Whetstone name. L is for loyal. He was loyal to his Lord, to his wife, his children, and to his country. E for equality. Not only did Dad, did no, not only did I never hear Daddy say anything condescending or racist, he also held Mom as an equal partner. They practiced the biblical model of him being the head of the house, but her input was equal and valuable to him. And as for noble, the definition of that is having or showing high moral qualities or ideals or greatness of character, having excellent qualities. What stone? W is wondrous. Daddy opened our eyes to so many things in the world. He showed us the wonder of flight or of the beauty of a sunset. He taught us about history and the wonderment of God's hand in it, or the, the precision and perfection of math, <laughs> and how moving could be an adventure. H is for hero and honor. Although he wasn't directly on the front lines of war, he did fly over the enemy lines and looked to see where the danger was. He was making our guys safer, and he was our hero in so many ways. He taught us our heritage, and then honoring others honored God. He is for eloquent. Before his illness began, Daddy was one of the most eloquent speakers. I guess all the briefings he gave to commanders and generals trained him to be that way. That was probably one of the hardest parts, watching him lose his words and speech. Tea is for tender. Despite his military persona and how many of my friends just feared him, <laughs> Daddy was a tender man. S is for sacrifice and servant. Daddy went on two year-long remote tours during his career in the Air Force first time to Thailand during Vietnam, and the second to South Korea. Many here at the church, you know his servant heart, especially all the years he was in charge of communion calling or communion here at the church. I have so many memories of visiting shut-ins after church and serving them communion. T is for trustworthy. Because he was an intelligence officer, Daddy was a person proven to be trustworthy. He could always, you could always take him at his word and know we knew that we could trust him with anything and everything. O is for one of a kind. That's all I have to say about that one. <laughs> N is for nostalgic. We love to hear stories about Daddy's life growing up, whether moving to different states, flying on a plane for the first time when that was pretty rare, or telling me the story of the day I was born. He is for eternal because Daddy submitted his life to Jesus Christ almost 40 years ago. He now lives in eternity, praising God, 
and visiting with all those family and friends who have passed on to glory. I have one more thing to read, and this is from Jessica. Dad was her person. <laughs> my grandpa, my person. Everyone who knew my grandpa could tell you how special of a person he was, how smart, kind, and happy he was almost all the time, how detailed he was when he would take notes, how long he would take when it was his turn in Shanghai or Rummy Cup, the way he would get distracted by the TV if it was on, his bugle wake-up calls, bugle not required. <laughs> He was always my constant friend and teacher growing up, taking me to state parks and museums to teach me about history, stopping to read every plaque and every sign in every room. He helped me appreciate that the world was bigger than just us. He taught me to never give up, no matter how hard it felt to keep going. I'm glad he taught you that too. <laughs> he always found a way to make me smile after I cried. He listened to my horrible days as much as my amazing days. And he had a smile that instantly infected everyone around him. Even his quirks would make you laugh, like the way he opened the paper on a wrap present with a knife, never torn. <laughs> or his late nice use of the printer. <laughs> the small extra squeeze of my hand in the end, like he knew his time was coming. And he wanted to make sure I knew how much he loved me. Jessica said he was my hero, my best friend, and the person I knew I could always count on. I know he'll be watching over Lyra and I forever now, and I hope I can be half the parent that he was. That's hard to follow. <laughs> what is a big brother? <clears throat> a big brother is often the firstborn. A big brother holds many titles and responsibilities. A big brother is one who his younger siblings look up to. A big brother sets the path for many to follow, should they choose. Though raised by the same parents, we each received different types of attention, and we each grew up to travel different paths. Let me share a few things you may not know about the big brother of Devin Jerry. Terry worked with the famous racing Unser family, washing Jerry's car many times after a race in the Hula Bowl. He left his family in Hawaii to travel to Illinois to attend school in Kiwani and help Grandpa Charlie and Grandma Mabel work on the farm. He taught me how to catch mice in the corn crib, swing them around by the tail, throw them at Deb only to watch her squeal and run. He taught us to climb into the foxholes on the base those were behind our house, a place that we learned to play army. He taught us how to catch horned toads, place them in a shoebox, keep them as a pet until they figured out how to get out. Then he would show us how to use a bowling pin as a bowling ball. As he worked at a bowling alley and brought home damaged pins, we set them up in the garage and we had our own bowling alley. Funny how a, a bowling pin flies a little bit differently than the, the ball. He took the time to teach of how to toss thin rubber bands onto the model battleships that he had built at Grandma Mabel's. Depending on where it hit, you got a score. Depending on when he decided it was time, whether or not the forerunner, and maybe this is where they got this from, but Terry would say, 
you sank my battleship. <laughs> in, the, in the amount of time that I played that game on the front porch at Grandma Mabel's, I think I only sank one battleship compared to his many that he destroyed on me. And sometimes there was only one rubber band, but it was very specific, specifically placed to blow up. If you've ever been to Terry and Jan's house, looked up and saw the wagon that is up above there. That's the same wagon we used to roll down the hill across from Grandma Mabel's. What Terry didn't share with us is the coaster brake really didn't work. You shared his excitement every time you went into the attic at Grandma Mabel's. Everything was always covered up with blankets or newspapers, searching for what we would be playing with that day. He taught us how to play with toy tractors and farm equipment. He took us outside and taught us how to push the dual blade mower. He showed us that building model planes, hanging them from the ceiling at different angles was cool. He shared from switching of playing a cornet to playing the baritone created a completely different sound. Terry helped design the banner at Tecumseh High School that they used in front of the marching band. He had experience. He participated in a band that had played in the Cotton Bowl. He knew that stuff. He taught us doing dishes while working at the Melody Restaurant would help him have gas money for his Corvair. Today, that Melody Restaurant is still there. I drive past it every day. I think about <clears throat> his Corvair and him doing dishes. They had a flood one time and he was in a panic. He would be the first of the three of us to graduate from Tecumseh High School. He would talk to us about ROTC as he became an Ohio University Bobcat. When asked what time it was in Athens, the answer was always the same, time to move the river. For those of you that know anything about Athens, the hawking on the river or hawking, I can't remember what all they said about it. The lower quad was always flooding and that. <clears throat> I'm blessed to have my association's Athletic Trainer Hall of Fame at Ohio U. I get to visit it and every time I cross that river, I hear this, it's time to move the river, pop into my head. He showed patience and calmness when he brought his bride out to get into the Corvair to go on their honeymoon and they were going to drive to the farm and switch the Corvair for the Rambler, is my understanding. Well, <clears throat> somehow when they came out, there were tree branches all over his car as if a tree had fallen on it. We, we took that tree that they were trimming up and hid the Corvair. <laughs> the orneriness of his little brother showing through. Lisa mentioned that he could get silly. Well, he did get silly. He loved the Three Stooges. <laughs> to see the family's expression when big brother and little brother would get on the floor and crawl around in circles doing the Three Stooges was always fun. <laughs> he would tell us that Deb got the beauty, Jerry got the brawn, but he got the brains. Very true. He was proud of the fact that the B-52 bombers that were once housed at Wright-Patterson were now in Omaha where he was stationed. We would often joke about the sonic booms that they had created when they were in Dayton. When he returned from Korea, Yobaseo was the first thing that you always heard as hello on the phone. He showed his pride in service by working in Washington, D.C. I wonder if the movie National Treasure with Nicolas Cage, if Terry would have maybe gone that direction and said, hey, <coughs> I, can, I can be in this movie. Would he have become an actor? He followed dad's path and made a career in the United States Air Force, something I'm very proud that he did. 
He taught us what a Nebraska Cornhusker was. You probably saw a picture of that corn grown out of his head. He taught us what an Oklahoma Sooner was. We would laugh at him. He took three briefcases full of work to the Brickyard 400. During the race, Terry's sitting there reading a book on Civil War. The cars would go by. He'd look up, watch them go past, look back down, absorbing that knowledge. Dad was so furious at him. I just couldn't figure out him and racing when he started with the Uncers. As we attended many Indy 500s and that, he eventually stopped going, but I would get a call every Memorial weekend. The voice on the other end would, would be, it's a beautiful day for a motor car race, imitating Jackie Stewart. Not quite as good as that, but always there. He demonstrated how to take life in stride when classmates of his nephews thought he was their grandpa at Tecumseh. His little brother would hear, met your dad today, Joe and Jake's grandpa, as he handed out SAR scholarships. Though dad started this, Terry was the one they remembered the most. Terry, we learned that Terry might take you on an adventure before getting to the point of a story. <laughs> a teacher of history or what or where one may have gone to get to the end. <clears throat> now, by a show of hands, how many of you have watched the Geico commercial of the man lining the baseball field and instead of being in a straight line, he's all over the diamond? That is Terry with a story. Never a straight line to the point. I see that commercial and I just bust out laughing. Terry would continue in mom and dad's tradition of having you sign the guest book before you left their house. He showed his quietness. He showed being passive. He showed one could be reserved. He showed what a patriot looked like, a quiet hero. He showed what a leader does while being involved with the Sons of American Revolution. He taught us the adaptability of a substitute, substitute teacher, regardless of the subject, regardless of the location. Terry loved to teach. He loved to help others. Now, reflecting back to those titles and responsibilities that I talked about a little earlier in the beginning, he shared what being a brother, a husband, a brother-in-law, a father, an uncle, a grandfather, a great uncle, and a great grandfather does. Have faith in Christ. Those are just some of the stories about our big brother, Terry Whetstone. Thank you. This is a word from grandson Adam that came about the day of his death. We were so sad to hear about grandpa passing, but so comforted, so comforted to know that he's in a better place. I smiled when I thought about how he is probably up there at the pearly gates right now giving Peter a history lesson <laughs> about the origin of the gate as a fortification device <laughs> or the history of decorative pearls. He was one of the smartest men I've ever had the pleasure of knowing, so genuinely kind. And I feel honored to have you both as my grandparents. Yeah. So much to say about Terry Whetstone. I want you to go on a journey with me. Let's, let's take a journey. Our first stop is Kiwani, Illinois in 1946. Apparently, the hog capital of the world. Population about 16,000. I don't know if that's hogs or people, but 
It's a small town in Illinois where there lived a young couple, Martin and Lois Whetstone, and their newborn baby boy, Terry. And maybe Terry's destiny as a proud patriot who loved his country was sealed when he was born into this military family because Martin was an active duty uh, with the Army Air Corps. He was active when Pearl Harbor was attacked December 7th, 1941, and the United States was dragged into the fray we know as World War II. And Martin was stationed in the Aleutian Islands during the war. But he, him and his family also called home bases in Great Falls, Montana, the Hawaiian Islands, two bases in Texas, and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, the triptych now takes us to Texas, but as Jerry said, it's an interesting trip. Terry's grandparents flew with him back to the United States, back to Kewanee, Illinois, while his parents took the six-week boat trip with their belongings back to the mainland and then on to Texas when Terry and his grandparents left Hawaii. It was 78 degrees, but below freezing when they arrived in Illinois. But Terry's grandparents enrolled him in school there in Kewanee, Illinois. So he wouldn't get behind waiting for his parents to arrive in Texas. And for several years, two years I think, he would go to school in Kewanee during the school year and then go to Texas in the summer with his parents. Now the excursion takes us here to the Buckeye State, Ohio, when they settled at Wright Pat University. And Terry attended Tecumseh schools, became active in ROTC. And upon graduation, we traveled to Athens, Ohio, to Ohio University, where he was also a member of the ROTC. He also served um, in the Methodist Service Fraternity, Sigma Theta Epsilon. And um, while we're in Athens, I want you to meet Nancy Scott. She was president of the Methodist Service Sorority, Kappa Phi. And in the summer of 1965, when the president of the fraternity, Terry's roommate Rick, and the vice president, and Terry, who was to be the secretary of the fraternity, um, they were going in that summer to meet with Nancy Scott, the sorority president, so they could plan their year together. And while they were there, they also met her lovely roommate named Jan Schneider. And it was more than a meeting of the Methodist Service Societies because it also became a night out with Nancy and Jan and dancing to the tunes and the doo-wops and the bebops of the 60s. And it happened that Jan ended up dating Rick and Terry, but she's more than convinced she got the best of that pair when she married Terry in 19, or, uh, 55 years ago. Uh, Terry became part of two honorary ROTC societies, the Arnold Air Society and the Scabbard and Blade. And as you've heard his history from his brother and his daughter, you know that he excelled at anything he tried. And he graduated in 1968 with distinguished honors, commissioned as a second lieutenant. 1968 meant the conflict in Vietnam. And so now we go with Terry to intelligence school at Lowry Air Force Base in Denver and for nine months, and then on to Thailand and Vietnam for a year. He served the Air Force for 20 years in Omaha, in Washington, D.C., two years in Korea. Finally, the trip ends in Ohio at Wright Pat, where he retired in 1988 as a major after 20 years of service. And Terry and Jan made their home here in northwest Clark County. Um, garden spot of the world. Passionate uh, about their kids and their endeavors. They were part of the northwestern local schools. And, and we want to pause at the soccer field there at Northwestern High School and go up to the press box. Um, Terry was Steve's, like, biggest soccer fan, as a dad should be. And he was so involved with the team that they asked him to announce at the home soccer games. And there happened to be a game where Terry vehemently, I mean vehemently, disagreed with the call of the referee on the field. And in his verbal lambasting of that referee, he forgot to turn off the microphone in the press box. <laughs> the official stops the game and threatens Terry with a red card. 
That's Terry. But Terry was brilliant. You know that. You did not want to play against him in Trivial Pursuit. His knowledge of history, geography, science, nature, arts and literature and sports were without measure. He did not like the entertainment category. <laughs> but upon a hearing of Terry's death, his grandson Adam wrote, one of the trivia teams in heaven just got a whole lot better. <laughs> when they would travel, Terry would see the historical markers posted alongside the road at the city limits. And if he didn't already know what was on there, he would stop, get out of the car, read that marker, maybe take a picture of it. Once he came upon one so suddenly that he skidded to a halt and a cake in the back seat fell right off onto the floor, Jan was not happy. <laughs> but after the Air Force, as we've heard, he served as a teacher, substitute teacher at many local school districts until 2018. And even up to his recent move to Hearth and Home where as they posted a picture on the wall, one of the nurses said, that's Mr. Whetstone. I had him as a substitute teacher. Um, students would remember him when they saw him in public places. So on this journey, all these memories and stories, the laughter and tears, for just a moment, uh, Terry is with us. For just a moment, there is no mystery disease. No tremors or shaking, no problems with posture or balance or walking or standing or sitting. No problems with speaking or remembering. There's just Terry quietly smiling. Always talking and explaining and helping and loving and influencing everyone he meets. And he never did meet a stranger. But when this moment is over and the funeral is finished, you and I, as Terry's friends and family, will resume our journey along the canyon of death. That's where our journey has taken us, the canyon of death. I don't know what you see or what you think, but I want you to go there with me. It's a desolate canyon. The dry ground is cracked and lifeless. The blistering sun heats the wind that moans eerily and stings mercilessly. Tears burn and words come slowly as we are forced to stare into this ravine. The bottom of the crevice is invisible. The other side is unreachable. You can't help but wonder what is hidden in the darkness of the canyon of death. And you can't help but long to leave there. And we've been there this week. In fact, you've been there since Terry began experiencing all these symptoms in 2019 that drain the life out of him. You've stood at the thin line that separates the living from the dead. And you sadly watched sickness corrode and atrophy his body. And you've asked the painful questions. Why? What for? And you've heard they, them ricochet off the canyon walls without any answer. Someone you love dearly. A husband, a father, a brother. A grandfather, an uncle, a friend, a colleague has been called into the unknown and we feel alone. Alone with our fears, alone with our doubts. And since this is the case, I want you to journey with me back in time. And please consider carefully the scene from the 11th chapter of John. In this scene there are three people, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Or excuse me, Mary, Martha, and Jesus. Mary and Martha send a message to Jesus. The one you love is sick and sinking fast. That would be their brother, Jesus' dear friend Lazarus. Yet Jesus doesn't go to them for four days. After the fever, after the last breath, after the preparations for burial, after the funeral, even after the burial in the tomb, Jesus doesn't go. And when he arrives, Martha's words were full of despair. If you had been here... If you had been here, she stares into Jesus' face with confused eyes. She'd been strong long enough, but now it hurt too badly. Lazarus was dead. Her brother was gone. And the one man who could have made a difference didn't. He didn't even make it for the burial. Something about death makes us accuse God of betrayal. If God were here... There wouldn't be a death. 
we claim. You see, if God is God anywhere, he has to be God in the face of death. Psychology can deal with depression. Peptos can deal with pessimism. Prosperity can handle hunger. But only God can deal with our ultimate dilemma, death. And only the God of the Bible has dared to stand on the canyon's edge and offer an answer. Terry Whetstone knew that. He believed that. He had all the confidence in the world in that. God has to be God in the face of death. If not, he's not God anywhere. Jesus wasn't angry at Martha. Perhaps it was his patience that caused her to change her tone from frustration to earnestness. Even now, even now, God will give you whatever, whatever you ask. Jesus then made one of those claims that, that place him either on the throne or in the asylum. Your brother will rise again. And Martha misunderstood. Who wouldn't? I know he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. But that wasn't what Jesus meant. I want you to un not under misunderstand the context of his words. Imagine the setting. Jesus has intruded the enemy's turf. He's standing in Satan's territory. He is at Death Canyon. Satan has been there. He has violated Lazarus, one of Jesus' dear friends and one of God's precious children. And with his foot firmly planted on the serpent's head, Jesus speaks loudly enough that his words echo off the canyon walls. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. This is a hinge point in history. Life confronts death and wins. The stage has been set for the soon coming confrontation at Calvary where Jesus is declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. But Jesus wasn't through with Martha. With eyes locked on hers, he asks the greatest question found in Scripture. A question meant for you and me as much as for Martha. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Wham! There it is. The bottom line. The dimension that separates Jesus from a thousand gurus and prophets who have come down the pike. The question that drives any responsible listener to absolute obedience to Jesus or total rejection of the Christ. Do you believe this? Let that question sink into your heart for a minute. Do you believe a young, penniless, itinerant Jewish carpenter is larger than your death? Do you truly believe that a man who died on a wooden cross at the hands of the Romans 2,000 years ago ultimately affects your eternity? Terry did. Terry did. Do you believe this? Jesus didn't pose this query as a topic for discussion in Sunday schools. It was never intended to be dealt with in stained glass sunlight or while seated on padded pews. This is a canyon question. A question that makes sense only during an all-night vigil by the bedside of one we love with all of our heart. A question that only makes sense when everything else in life is taken away. For then we must face ourselves as we really are. We are rudderless human beings, tail spinning toward disaster. And we are fo forced to see Jesus for what he claims to be. Our only hope. As much out of desperation as inspiration, Martha says, yes. I believe. And as she looked into the face of that Galilean carpenter, something told her she'd probably never get closer to the truth than she was right now. So she gave him her hand and let him lead her away from that canyon wall. And what does Jesus do next? He weeps. He sits with Mary and Martha, puts an arm around each of them, and he sobs. 
Among the three, a storm of sorrow is stirred. A monsoon of tears is released. Jesus weeps. He weeps with them. He weeps for them. He weeps with you. He weeps for you. He weeps so we will know mourning is not disbelieving. Flooded eyes don't represent a faithless heart. A person can enter a cemetery, Jesus certain of life after death, and still have a crater of sorrow in their heart. Jesus did. He wept. And he knew it was ten minutes from seeing Lazarus again. And his tears give you permission to shed your own tears. Grief doesn't mean you don't trust. It simply means you can't stand the thought of another day without the Lazarus or the Terry Whetstone of your life. And if Jesus gives the love, he understands the tears. So grieve, but don't grieve like those who have no hope. Don't grieve like those who don't know the rest of the story. Knowing the end of the story doesn't mean you don't cry at the sad parts. Jesus touches Martha's cheek and he gives Mary a hug and turns to face the grave and he tells Martha to have that grave open. She shakes her head and starts to refuse, but then she pauses and says, open it. Verse 43, Lazarus, come out. Verse 44, he who died came out. Dead men don't do that, do they? Dead men don't wake up. Dead hearts don't beat. Dried blood doesn't rush. Empty lungs don't inhale. No, dead men don't come back to life unless they hear the voice of the Lord of life. The ears of the dead may be deaf to your voice and mine, but not to his. Paul tells us in Romans, the 14th chapter, the 9th verse, Christ is Lord of both the dead and the living. When Christ speaks to the dead, the dead listen. Lazarus steps from the tomb, alive. Terry may have taken his last breath on this earth on June 19th. But he also took his first breath in heaven that day. The first voice he heard, Terry, was Jesus. And when he opened his eyes, the first person he saw was Jesus, the Lord of the living and the dead. Terry Whetstone has never been more alive than he is right now. Because he knew and he heard the voice of his Lord and Savior, Jesus. John speaks about it this way in the Revelation. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them. And be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. No tremors or shaking. No problems with posture or balance or walking or standing or sitting. No problems with speaking or remembering. For we know who has the final say about death. Jesus, Lord of the dead and the living. Your words can't give a Lazarus back to his sisters, but, Je but Jesus' words can. And your words can't bring Terry back to you in this life, but God's words give Terry life everlasting. And God's, word, God's words can give you the same. And it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time before he speaks. Because Paul tells us this, 1 Thessalonians 4, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout. All the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Then we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and remain with him forever. Till then we may grieve and we may miss Terry. But not like those who have no hope. And so now, we hope. We wait, but we hope. And we wait, and we hope, and we listen. We listen for his voice. Him who is the Lord of the dead and the living. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, 
We thank you this day for your precious, eternal, unchanging word. We thank you that you are to us the resurrection and the life. We do want to believe that. We do want to embrace that. And so in the face of our natural sorrow, we thank you for your supernatural comfort and grace. In the face of Terry's death, we thank you for your gift of eternal life. In the face of separation, we thank you for the eternal reunion we so eagerly anticipate. For the gentle life of, of Terry Whetstone here on this earth, we are so grateful. And so with gratitude, Father, we pray that in the days and weeks and months to come, these realities in the abiding presence of your spirit will especially strengthen, sustain, and comfort Terry's family, his friends, and your grace and peace be ours, both now and forever, until we all get to heaven. Amen. Stand with me and sing. Shout the
Bears gather at the Big Sky Station Paul Bear, trying to club up and it's pretty quick over there. there
behalf of the President of the United States, the United States Air Force, and a grateful nation, please accept this flag as a symbol of our appreciation to the loved ones honorable and faithful service. Does include our services for Terry here at the church. May we continue visiting. May we